Hey fellow anime enthusiasts and fans of epic crossovers, welcome back to our channel. Today, we're diving headfirst into a world where ninja meets hunters and huntresses. That's right, we're exploring the incredible crossover of Naruto in the world of our WBY. But before we jump into the action, make sure to smash that like button to show your support and subscribe to our channel for more thrilling anime crossovers, fan theories, and exciting content. Don't miss out on the fun, join our community today. Alright, enough waiting. Let's begin the adventure of a lifetime with Naruto and the world of our WBY. The start of the Chunin exam was a little lackluster compared to what the rest of the group was hoping for, but interesting nonetheless. They watched as Team 7 arrived at the academy and got a good kick out of watching the newly introduced Rock Lee knock Sasuke down a peg. What? Wait. New. Yang yelled out as the horror of Guy and Lee's sunset Jinjutsu burned an everlasting image in her eyes. The rest of the group suffered the same fate. What the hell is that? The gravelly voice of Crow rang out in panic, an odd emotion from the usually lazy man. After they all recovered from the horrible sunset genjutsu, the team finally made it to the correct Chunin exam room, where all the other rookies were formally introduced. It was a rather tense introduction all things considered. Another Kanoha Jinin, Kabuto, made himself known, showing the rookies information about other Jinin taking the exam. Sasuke asked for information on both Gara from Suna and Rock Lee, the Jinin that beat him just minutes ago. After Kabuto finished explaining what he could, Naruto's younger self made his proclamation to all the other Jinin, effectively painting a target on his back. That wasn't too smart, Ruby said lowly. Naruto just let out a hearty laugh. No, I guess it wasn't. I was really excited for this exam. I couldn't help myself. Kabuto was soon attacked by a team of sound Jinin. The group paid close attention to the attack, hoping to see what the Jinin from the village were capable of. They saw Kabuto clearly dodge the attack, but somehow he still suffered from it. His glasses cracked, and he got nauseous enough to throw up. At least he didn't get it on anybody's shoes, Young said plainly. Although everybody was curious as to how the sound ninja managed to affect Kabuto like that, they were forced to shelve the curiosity as the proctor for the exam made his entrance. The entire first exam was an altogether interesting event. The group was free to roam around and observe as multiple jinin went about gathering information in their own unique ways. Anything to get the job done. I guess, Blake commented as she saw Eno use her mind transfer jutsu to get all the information she needed. Looks like some people are just smart enough to know, though, Yang commented snarkily as she watched Sakura answer the needed questions without any outside support. And some, definitely aren't, Why scoffed as she watched the younger Naruto internally panic. Finally, when the 10th question was revealed to actually be the decision on whether to continue or try again later, Team RWY was quite shocked. But, who could have thought that would be the result? Weiss asked, confused. I lived in a place where deception is layered on top of more and more deception. A true ninja must see underneath the underneath, Naruto said. He faltered when everybody stared at him blankly. All right, maybe I didn't know that as a kid, but it is still a good test. Then Anko Mitarashi made her excitable entrance, causing the girls of RWY to recoil. She just dresses like that. Why stammered out with a mild blush? Naruto shrugged lightly. Anko is a part of the torture and interrogation division, so she is a little more geared towards it but Kunoichi often find themselves on missions where they must seduce a target to gather information or infiltrate a certain area. It's to be expected that some of them go with it in their day-to-day -day activities. Wa, well, why stammered out. The village expects women to whore themselves out just for a mission. Naruto stared blankly at Weiss. I said seduce men, not sleep with them. In most situations, a Kunoichi really just has to hint at sexual relations, and a man will spill whatever they know. For lower-level missions where that isn't enough, interrogation is typically preferred. On higher-profile missions where you can't just kidnap and interrogate somebody, Kunoichi do find themselves sleeping with targets occasionally. Team RWY blushed at his blunt wording. Weiss quickly overcame this at the end of Naruto's explanation, however. Naruto interrupted her attempted comment with a raised hand. I don't like it either. The thought of anybody I care about having to do that is not something I would like to think about, but for most Kunoichi, if it means the safety of their home, they wouldn't even have to second-guess. I would like to think that if I ever became Hokage, I would make sure that a mission like that never passed my desk, but the fact remains that seduction itself is useful. Nobody can extract a secret from a man's lips quite like a woman. Men are extremely loose-lipped when they are happy. As he finished, he turned back to look at Team or WY, making brief eye contact with each of them, causing them all to blush and look away. Naruto rolled his eyes at their embarrassment. Come on, aren't I supposed to be the immature one here? It's just a fact. Young got over her initial embarrassment first looking at her other teammates whose eyes were all still glued to the ground, refusing to look anywhere near Naruto. She let out a hearty laugh, finally breaking the other girls out of their funk and making Weiss and Blake both scowl. Ruby softly smiled before turning back to the scene playing out in front of them. 
The scene had changed during their conversation, showing Anko explaining the second test to them. When the test began, Team 7 found themselves in multiple situations, before stumbling across their confrontation with Orochimaru. There were plenty of gasps and wide eyes at the fight. Many times that they thought Sasuke had gotten the snake-like man, he just slipped away seemingly unharmed. There were noises of disgust when Naruto escaped from the snake's stomach using Kage Bunshin. Finally, Orochimaru left after marking Sasuke. The group as a whole was rather angry when Naruto explained what the curse mark's purpose was. He was terrifying, Blake said, her ears pressed flat against her head. The rest of her team nodded in agreement, and even the adults appeared to be disturbed. He just wouldn't die, Yang yelled out. He just kept slipping away somehow. Naruto nods in agreement, he is an S-rank missing Nin from Kanoa. One of the three legendary San Nin, who defected from the village after Gigi found out that he was experimenting on children. He has no morals and is only concerned with strength and achieving immortality. He is the root of a lot of Kanoa's problems in the future. It's to be expected that a team of Jinin fresh out of the academy wouldn't be able to pose a threat to him. So, Blake starts to ask, was he just toying with you all? Absolutely, Naruto says without hesitation. Ruby shivers as she thinks back on Orochimaru sealing Naruto's chakra. The flames on the Sanin's fingers and the look of agony in the younger Naruto's eyes bring her back to the night of the battle at Haven Academy. I guess, you really did know what you were doing with Cinder. I never thought that it would have happened to you when you were so young. Ruby says sadly. Naruto looks at her curiously, I guess so. Instead of pulling mine out, he just basically knotted it up. I guess it's slightly similar, but I'm sure Cinder's was more painful. Even so, my body at 12, even with my high pain tolerance and resilience, couldn't handle the pain. Ruby sighs sadly at this. The thought of a 12-year-old boy experiencing so much pain was a concept that she didn't want to accept. There were definitely amazing things in this world, but was the trade-off really worth it? She didn't think so. She shakes the thoughts out of her head as she watches Sakura get both of the boys to a somewhat safe space. It wasn't long until the sound team from earlier found them. Although Lee and Team Ten all came to help, it didn't seem to be enough to deter the team from their target, Sasuke. They are all impressed with Sakura's conviction in protecting her teammates but are quickly distracted from that by the presence of something foul suddenly seeping into the air. Sasuke was awake, and he now is surrounded by a sickly-looking purple aura, with black markings wrapping around half his body. What followed could only be described as gruesome. A complete lack of restraint or empathy from Sasuke led to one of the sound ninja's arms being dislocated. Sasuke was determined to finish the sound team off but was stopped by Sakura. That was a little intense, Young says with wide eyes, the rest of her team, and the adults nodding in agreement. Team 7 continues through the forest, finding Kabuto, and managing to secure both scrolls. They make it to the tower in the center of the forest, successfully completing the second part of the exam. You came close to dying so many times, Ruby says disbelievingly. I don't even want to think about how many people actually did die. Naruto doesn't answer her, knowing that any answers he had would only make her feel worse. The scene cuts to the preliminaries, which are quickly explained by Naruto. The first match is between Sasuke and one of Kabuto's teammates. The match was close due to Sasuke's problems with the curse mark but was able to pull the win at the last minute. The second match was very nauseating for the girls of Team RWY. The sudden appearance of bugs coming from within Shino was only beaten by the holes blown in Zaka's arms when he attempted to use the wind tunnels in his hands. The third match was Kankuro against Misumi from Kabuto's team. Although the flexibility from Misumi was impressive, the girls can't help but flinch at the sound of Kankuro's neck breaking. Much to their surprise, however, Kankuro was actually hidden inside of the wrappings carried by his own puppet. Oh, Ruby gasps. That's so cool. I wonder if I could control Crescent Rose like that. The rest of her team feels a shiver run down their spine at the thought of Ruby cackling with a floating scythe flying around her. The fourth match between Ino and Sakura was lackluster compared to the previous ones, resulting in a double knockout. The fifth match, however, was the complete opposite, with a brutal end by Tenen landing on the unforgiving tip of Temari's fan. The sixth match between Shikamaru and Kin was extremely entertaining for Weiss, Blake, and Ashbin in particular. While Weiss and Ashbin enjoyed the quickly formed strategy by Shikamaru, Blake was much more interested in his use of shadows. She had learned how to use her ring to form defenses and attacks from shadows, but this was a use of them that left her craving even more. She turns to look at Naruto inquisitively. Naruto nods, understanding the unspoken question. I can help you try but it's likely you won't be able to do everything that the Nara clan can with shadows until you have your core merged. You need to have the use of chakra through your whole body for possession, but shadow stitching might be something you can do on a small scale. What is shadow stitching? Blake asks excitedly. Her team takes a step back from her, being in use to Blake being excited about, well, anything really. Naruto just chuckles, well, you already have the concept down. 
It's giving Shadow a solid form and using it in a piercing manner. You can already do makeshift shields and smaller blades, but this would be longer. It would kind of be like Gamble Shroud. It would be a surprisingly long-ranged weapon. It had been a while since Blake grinned the way she did at Naruto. It was easy to see how excited she was to learn, and Naruto had the feeling that he wouldn't get away without starting her on it for too long. Next was Naruto's match against Kiba. It appeared to be going well at first, with Naruto using his quick wits in battle as well as he can. Naruto sighs when the match reaches its end, however. You. Ruby says with a wrinkled nose. Well, that ending stinks, Yang says, causing everybody to groan. Hey, if it works, it works, Crow chirps in with a shrug. It got him into the finals, didn't it? They watch as Hinata gives Naruto an ointment for a scratch from the fight. So that's that healing ointment, huh? Young asks. Yeah, Naruto says. At the time, I thought that it was really magical stuff with how fast I healed. But now I kinda understand that even though it is great ointment, Karama was really the reason I healed so fast. The next match was between the two Hugas. The bad blood between Hinata and Niji is revealed to everybody, and the brutality that Niji attacks Hinata with is just as dark. He is going to kill her. He wants to kill her, Crow says. The only reason anybody isn't worried about Hinata is because Naruto hasn't implied that she dies in any way. Niji had a lot of good reasons to be mad as a child. Unfortunately, he just chose to be mad at the wrong people, Naruto says sadly. In the end though, he was a good person. Just angry. Was. Ruby turns to him and asks. Naruto stays silent, not wanting to speak about it yet. Ruby quickly picks up on the look of pain on Naruto's face and decides not to pry. Unfortunately, the look in his eyes gave her all the answers she needed. The match ended with the Jonin stopping Niji from actually killing Hinata. Naruto's younger self makes his oath to Niji. You know she looks so nice, but that be a Kugan thing really makes her look a little scary, Yang says. Heh, Naruto chuckles. You should see her when she... He trails off as he thinks back on Pain's invasion. He thinks back on her words to him. He remembered Hinata jumping in to save him, and he remembered Pain stabbing her, but everything in between that was just a blur. When she what? Blake asks. The rest lean in curiously. When she is protecting somebody she cares about, Naruto says sadly. He sighs before shaking his head and looking towards Lee and Gara, who had walked down to the arena area. Other than Kakashi against Tsubuza, this was the fastest paced fight any of the group had seen yet. They were originally impressed with Lee's skills when he fought Sasuke, but this fight quickly shows how little of a problem Sasuke was to Lee. When Lee drops his weights, everybody's jaw drops. And when he disappears, Ruby's head is the only one that is able to follow him on Team RWY. Young, Weiss, and Blake all decide to keep their eyes on Gara to follow the fight, but Ruby's eyes trace all over the arena, following Lee's every movement. I can barely keep up, Ruby says with a grin and eyes wide with wonder. Now it's her turn to look to Naruto with an excited look. He used weights to get this fast, right? Do you think I could do that too? Naruto gives her a smile and pats her head. Sure. I know some weight seals. We can add them when we get back. It'll probably be tough though. Ruby's grin was so bright it could have easily rivaled her silver eyes power. She was so excited at the thought of starting weight training that she even forgot to act annoyed with the head pat. Naruto smiles brightly back at her, a feeling of satisfaction blooming in his chest. What a pretty smile. Lee's next move was opening the inner gates. This causes Naruto to ponder on the usefulness of them. Would that be worth learning? Naruto thinks to himself. It took Bushy Brow's four years of training just to get to the sixth gate. Would it be worth it when the Atsutsuki come? Naruto is torn from his thoughts by a gasp from the girls. It seemed like Lee got caught in Gara's sand after an unsuccessful primary lotus. Guy stops Gara from hurting Lee any further just as Naruto remembered. Naruto wasn't able to continue his line of thought on the inner gates due to the rest of the group's inquisitiveness. The unfortunate part of living through Naruto's life as they were was that some answers were only left to Naruto to answer, and he certainly felt like he was not the best person to answer them at times. Before they knew it, Dosu and Choji's match was over, and the matchups for the finals were announced. The scene changed once again to Naruto at the hot springs, training with a nerdy looking Jonin. They watch as Naruto tries and fails to learn water walking. Before too long, the younger Naruto is introduced to Jiraiya. The group's eyes all light up in recognition when the Sanin introduces himself, but all of the women found themselves unimpressed. He's a perv, Weiss says blandly. Not trying to be rude, but what made you want to train with him exactly? Naruto chuckles. He looked strong to me. What can I say? He says with a shrug. They keep watching as the younger kid tries to convince Jiraiya to teach him. Everybody deadpants when Jiraiya reveals what he wants in order to train Naruto, and the women quickly anger when the younger Naruto uses his transformation jutsu again to convince him. Really? Weiss yells in frustration. Naruto hangs his head in shame, looking back on it. Not my proudest moment. But it did get me a great teacher. Actually, he probably would have trained me regardless. 
Ruby shakes her head in amusement. They watch as Jiraiya makes a poor attempt at training Naruto while watching girls play near in the water nearby. Disgusting, Weishoffs. Men like him are the reason women are cautious about these things. Jiraiya eventually releases the five-pronged seal placed by Orochimaru. After the younger ninja shows that he is able to water walk, Jiraiya begins teaching him summoning. As the group watches, however, Naruto begins thinking. I don't have the toads anymore, Naruto thinks sadly. I want to learn something to remember him by, but what? Naruto is forced to abandon this thought as he sees Jiraiya and his younger self walking out of Kanoa. It had obviously been a few weeks since Naruto had started training with Jiraiya, which meant only one thing. Okay, guys, don't panic, Naruto says as Jiraiya starts idly chatting with the younger ninja. What do you mean? Ruby asks with a tilt of her head. Yeah, wah, oh my god. Yang yells out as Jiraiya buries his fist in the younger Naruto's gut. What is he doing? Ruby yells, waving her arms around frantically. Oh, nothing too bad, just watch, Naruto says with a weak chuckle. Actually, I wonder how Jin will play this one out. What do you mean? Can you just explain what is going on? Weiss asks exasperatedly. Oh, Naruto. I said I have to have my fun, didn't I? Jin's voice rings around them as the scene changes to the younger Naruto waking up in a stranger area. Oh boy. Naruto sighs out. Before anybody can ask, Jiraiya flings Naruto through the bushes behind him. Nobody even has a chance to form a thought before the scene changes, and they are once again beside the younger Naruto, with nothing beneath their feet. Naruto sighs as everybody begins to fall with the younger boy. Screams ring out around him as Weish tries to form her gravity glyphs to slow their fall. When nothing happens, she joins the rest of her team in their screams. The older Naruto watches as his younger self tries and fails to stick to the wall. Naruto shakes his head in amusement while everybody else continues to panic. I think you've had your fun now. Naruto yells out into the wind. Suddenly the group is standing upright in a sewer. The group, still screaming, quickly realizes that they are once again on solid ground. That was so not cool. Yang yells up into the air. They only receive a giggle in response. Where are we? Ruby asks, looking around. Naruto spreads his arms out. Welcome to the inside of my mind. My mindscape, bit of a dump I know. I'd say get ready to meet Kurama, but he's a bit of a downer right now. This is depressing, Yang says, looking around at the rundown looking sewer. This is the inside of your mind? Naruto rolls his eyes. It isn't actually a sewer. This is just what it looks like based on my childhood experiences. Don't let this be another argument for your jokes. If you're gonna call me stupid, you gotta do it based on what I do. Yang smirks at Naruto. He had seemingly read her mind. A joke had been on the tip of her tongue. They watch as the younger Naruto meets Kurama and demands his chakra from him. Surprisingly enough, the fox agrees to it. I really didn't think he would give it to you, Yang says, impressed by Naruto's confidence when speaking with the demon. Naruto chuckles as they found themselves at the top of the cliff, beside Jiraiya. I still can't believe he did that to you. Ruby says in disbelief. Sometimes the best way to learn is by having your life on the line, Naruto says wisely. The younger Naruto summons Gamabunta, much to the amazement of everybody else, and manages to complete the challenge of staying on his back until sundown. The scene changes once again, showing Naruto's younger self walking through the village. The young ninja appeared to be extremely downtrodden, surprising the others. What's wrong with you? Young asks. Hiki. Naruto chuckles. I was having some doubts. I kinda didn't think that I could beat Niji honestly, but I ended up getting the pep talk I needed. And who happened to do that? Ashbin asks. Naruto shrugs in response, maybe you'll see. And sure enough, the young ninja finds himself walking to the training ground that he took Kakashi's bell test in, only to find Hinata there. Oh, that is adorable. Yang squeals as she watches the two's conversation. Naruto cocks an eyebrow in confusion, eliciting a wave of dismissal from Yang as she continued watching the conversation in fascination. Ruby sighs quietly in disappointment. Ever since the Chunin exam started, Naruto and Hinata have been having a lot of moments together that just made it difficult. Everything in her was telling her that she shouldn't like a girl that had a crush on the guy that she was crushing on herself, but Hinata was just so nice. It seemed like Hinata had admired Naruto for a long time, possibly even since they were kids. It was depressing to think of what Hinata must have been going through, seeing that Naruto ended up dying. Nothing Naruto has said even alluded to him and Hinata having any kind of romantic relationship. The regret that Hinata must be feeling on top of everything else had to be absolutely traumatizing. It makes Ruby wonder if Naruto even knew about the feelings that Hinata obviously had for him. Boys are just clueless, Ruby thinks to herself with a smile. She then frowns, I guess that is just part of the risks. If you are going to live a dangerous life, you have to make sure you don't have any regrets. The scene changes once again, bringing Ruby out of her thoughts. The younger Naruto had somehow managed to make a fool of himself by being late and somehow barging into the arena in a trail of dirt. The first match was between Niji and Naruto. 
It was honestly a well-fought match, and the group was constantly left wondering what the next move would be. It was surprising to see Naruto use Kurama's chakra to open up his tenketsu, but the real surprise was the ending. You dug through the ground with just your hands. Blake exclaims. That had to have been painful. Look, Ruby says, pointing at Naruto's fingers, which were dripping blood from the quick and forced tunnel making. I always keep my word, Naruto says simply when everybody turns to look at him with a questioning look. I suppose that is one way to win a fight, Ashpin says, with Maria giving an approving nod. With Sasuke still absent, the match between Shikamaru and Tamari is the next fight. The fight was definitely more intellectual than physical, but that didn't make it any less interesting to most of the group. With Crow, Ruby, and Yang being the only ones not overly taken with the match, he just gave up? Weiss yells out in frustration. Ashpin smirks as he watches the lazy Nara. It is considered a good trait to know when you are at your limit, however. I believe he didn't really want to finish that fight out of mercy more than limitations. Blake whirls around to Naruto, grabbing him by the jacket and shaking him roughly. You have to teach me that. Uh? Naruto groans out, trying to shake off the sudden bout of dizziness. Only after nodding his head rapidly does Blake finally relent. Kankuro forfeits when it is time for his and Shino's fight, leaving it to just Gara and Sasuke. With Sasuke still not present, it appears that the match will be cancelled. After the final 10-minute extension, Kakashi and Sasuke appear in the nick of time. Special treatment for special people, huh? Blake says with a scowl. Naruto nods, in a way. It really was the only way to keep people happy. A lot of the guests made the multi-day trip just to see the last Uchiha fight. Blake rolls her eyes but doesn't say anything else. The scene changes to Naruto and Shikamaru walking back to the contestant booth. They see Gara being confronted by two ninja from Kuzigakure. They wonder what the significance of this is until the cork pops out of Gara's gourd. He isn't going to. Weiss asks disbelievingly. Yeah, he is, Naruto answers. All of Team RWY averts their eyes as the two shinobi are dragged into the darkened hallway by waves of sand. You're going to have to learn how to look, Naruto comments grimly as he watches Gara walk past his shaken younger self and Shikamaru. Why would we watch something like that? Yang says with a frown, her eyes still avoiding the hallway that the two shinobi had been left in. Her teammates were also still looking away. Weiss and Blake were visibly bothered, but Ruby was visibly shaking as she watched Gara walking down the steps. A couple of reasons. Some more important than others, Naruto answers. You need to make sure they're dead, or at least make sure they're out of the fight. What good is stabbing somebody if they just come right back at you because you didn't make sure you hit them where it hurt? Kids right, Crow says, reaching for his flask and scowling when he couldn't find it. You never know when an enemy has a trick up their sleeve. Best to be as sure as you can that they are out. And it's disrespectful, Naruto says firmly. To have somebody die in front of you and not even have the decency to acknowledge them in their final moments. Sasuke killed me, but at least he looked me in the eye when he did it. Even if you aren't the one to do it, you should give a dying human being the courtesy of your attention, not your disgust. Team RWY is grimly silent, only broken by Ajbin giving his opinion. I know that I may not have the most valuable opinion with you all at the moment, but if I may. When Team RWY grudgingly looks toward him, he continues, I have lived and died many times, so perhaps I am the most qualified in this matter. Dying alone is terrifying, even for somebody who has done it over and over again. Having somebody there, even if it is the one who did the deed, makes it easier. I know that nobody in this world can see us, but perhaps it would be best to practice on this sooner rather than later. Rather than wait for their reply, the adults and Naruto look out toward the arena. The scene had shifted to Kakashi, Guy, and company's point of view. Ruby quickly focuses on the fight, trying to get her mind off the two deaths she just witnessed. Watching the beginning of the fight almost brought about the same wonder as the fight between Lee and Gara. He isn't quite as fast as Lee, but he is still close, Ruby says. It was impressive that the Uchiha managed this much improvement in just a month, but it didn't seem to be enough. Finally, Gara retreats into a dome of sand, leaving Sasuke with few options. When Sasuke leaps onto the side of the arena wall, he forms a few hand signs before pointing his hand at the ground. What is he doing? Blake mumbles to herself, squinting her eyes at Sasuke's hunched form. Suddenly, there seems to be a spark from Sasuke's hand. Before the one turns into ten, the ten to a hundred, a hundred to a thousand. As the attack charges, the sound of it was that of a storm of birds chirping relentlessly. What is that? Ruby asks Naruto in awe. That is the only original technique of Kakashi Sensei. An assassination technique made famous for its piercing power. The technique uses the built-up speed of the user and the piercing form of the lightning chakra. Combining the two makes the technique almost unrivaled. Kakashi Sensei named his perfected version of it Raikiri or Lightning Blade after he cut a lightning bolt in half. This is the Chidori, 1000 birds. Ruby turns her head to look back at Naruto from her place at the railing. So it's a speed-based jutsu, huh? She says with a smile. Is that something we can learn? 
Blake asks curiously. The look on both her and Ruby's faces made it clear to Naruto that they would definitely be getting an answer. Naruto sighs out. You know if you guys keep adding everything you see to your to-learn list, you'll never be done, right? At least when Weiss saw Haku's ice mirrors, she didn't hound me about it. Obviously, Weiss huffs. But you can teach me that, right? Naruto throws his arms up in exasperation. He looks to Maria, Ashbin, and Crow for help, but only gets shrugs in response. He looks at Yong, expecting her to follow the rest of her team, only to see her shrug as well. Give me a bigger boom than the boom I already got, and we are good. Naruto smiles despite himself. He shakes his head at Team RWY's antics, before returning his focus to the fight. Sasuke starts his descent to the ground, his Chidori cutting through the hard concrete as he gets closer and closer to Gara. Spikes burst from the Dome of Sand, only for Sasuke to weave his way through them. He slams the arm directly into the dome, piercing it with little trouble. Silence reigns through the stadium as the audience waits to see if the attack was effective. Finally, the silence is broken by an ear-piercing scream from within the dome. The group is quickly distracted from the fight in the stadium as feathers begin falling into the audience stance. The group notices nothing different in themselves but notices everybody else starting to fall asleep. There is a burst of smoke from the Hokage stands, surprising the group yet again. What's happening? Ruby asks as she looks around frantically. Naruto looks around at the things going on around him. He had been asleep for the first part of the invasion, so he was slightly curious about what happened before he was woken up. This is the invasion of Kanoha by Suna and Odo. This was my first taste of war technically speaking. Is this how the war started? Ashbin asks curiously as fights begin breaking out throughout the stadium. No, Naruto shakes his head. This is nothing compared to the war. If it wasn't for the man leading the attack, this wouldn't have been nearly as impactful. Orochimaru is the only reason this was as serious as it was. Team RWY shudders at the memory of the snake Sanin. That weirdo did this? Young asks. Naruto nods as the scene changes. Noticing that his younger self and Sakura are approaching Sasuke and Gara in the middle of a forest, Naruto quickly fills the group in. Kakashi Sensei gave Sakura, Shikamaru, and me a mission to help Sasuke with Gara. We went to help, and Shikamaru and Shino had to stay behind to keep the enemy ninja off of us. Sasuke battled with Gara before we got there, but he was exhausted when we arrived. He looks like a monster. Blake says fearfully when she notices Gara's appearance. Yeah. Naruto agrees sadly. But he isn't. He just has some things that he has to learn. Gara quickly proves to be too much of a powerful foe for Team 7. Sakura was rendered unconscious, and Sasuke was still extremely exhausted. Gara gets more and more unstable by the second, leaving the group tense in anticipation. Naruto and the group continue watching as Naruto's younger self struggles on his own against Gara. Finally, the younger ninja seems to land a solid hit. You shoved a knife up his ass? Crow asks incredulously. Before anybody can look towards Naruto in confusion, the kanai explodes, with a little extra. Naruto says with a smirk. Clever. Ashpin says with a chuckle. Naruto's younger self seems to get a bit of an edge after that attack, creating hundreds of clones and putting quite a beating on Gara. Finally, Gara had enough. He releases Shikaku and engulfs Naruto in a sand coffin. Everybody stiffens in fright, hoping that Naruto has something else up his sleeve. And that something just so happened to be Gamabunta. Naruto, using Kurama's chakra, summons Gamabunta much to the shock of everybody present. Well, Ruby says in awe at the demolished landscape. Like I said, my skills are mostly destructive. Naruto says, I know you have all seen Gamabunta already, but this time you'll be able to see just how awesome he can be. This fight is ridiculous. Weiss says, her eyes wide as she stares up at the two gigantic beasts in front of her. Yeah, Naruto says, before smirking and looking at Weiss. So, I couldn't beat you at 13? Weiss breaks her attention from the two beasts before turning to Naruto and flaring her nostrils. Whatever. Naruto lets out a hearty laugh, to which Weiss gives a small smile and a shake of her head as she looks back to the fight. The two beasts clash with each other, Gamabunta successfully cutting off one of Shikaku's arms. Gara quickly responds, putting himself to sleep and allowing Shikaku to take over. The two exchange ranged attacks, air and water buffeting the trees below them. Finally, Naruto and Gamabunta seem to come up with a plan. What are you two going to do? Blake asks Naruto. I can't just tell you, Naruto says sarcastically. It would ruin the suspense. Team RWY stares blankly at him, causing him to motion towards the fight. Gamabunta charged at Shikaku, before a cloud of smoke billows around him. From the cloud of smoke, an exact replica of Kurama appears. Nice. Yang says simply as Gamabunta latches onto Shikaku with Kurama's claws. Naruto releases the transformation and leaps from Gamabunta's head in one fluid motion. He delivers a swift blow to Gara, waking him up. Even after waking up, Gara puts up a fight, threatening to swallow Naruto with the sand that made up Shikaku's head. 
Naruto somehow manages to summon one last bit of chakra, freeing himself from Gara's sand and launching himself at the other Jinchuriki once again. Gara uses his sand to block, forcing Naruto to headbutt him. Shikaku's form finally falls apart, causing the two Jinchuriki to fall down to the forest floor. Gamabunta and Gamakichi finally leave, causing the two boys to sent to alter. They both land on top of separate trees, facing each other. Naruto's younger self once again bests Gara, landing another blow to him as they both fall once again, hitting the ground. You guys really are. Ruby says, watching the two struggle to move even an inch from their prone positions. You guys really are fighting to the death. They listen as the younger Naruto starts crawling towards Gara with nothing but his chin, speaking of his own childhood of solitude and his newfound family. He speaks with conviction as he talks to Gara, And that's why I won't allow them to get hurt. The younger boy says to Gara, Even if that means I have to kill you. Ruby shakes her head slightly, as if disagreeing with herself. Naruto lifts a hand to place it on her shoulder, intending on finding out what was wrong, but as soon as the hand touches her, she turns away. She walks away, separating herself from the group. The rest of Team RWY exchanges glances, wondering what was going on. When Weiss takes a step towards Ruby, Yang gently grabs her arm. Why shoots Young a questioning look, only to get a small head shake in response. They decide to leave Ruby to her thoughts for the time being. They watch as Sasuke tells Naruto that Sakura was safe, only for the younger Naruto to immediately fall unconscious. Naruto glances over to Ruby, seeing her watching as well, her brows furrowed as if she were thinking about something. The scene changes to Hiruzen's funeral. They watch the village grieve over a beloved leader's death. I'm sorry for your loss, Blake says, looking over to Naruto. He seemed important to you. Naruto looks at her in surprise. Uh, thank you, he was. People hated when I called him Gigi, but it really was because I saw him as my grandfather. He taught me a lot of good lessons. Sometime after, Naruto is eating at Ichiraka's when Jiraiya arrives and informs him of the mission to find Sanade. Or part of it, at least. So, Naruto and Jiraiya depart the village and eventually find themselves in another small town. Jiraiya, in typical fashion, leaves Naruto at the hotel as he chases after a woman that caught his eye. Said it once, and I'll say it again. Disgusting. Why spites out with a scowl? Naruto shakes his head. He is a perv, but I promise he is a great guy. When it comes down to it, he cares for people. Why sighs but nods. If she has learned anything in recent times, it's that Naruto is a good person. Odd, but good. If he says Jiraiya is a good person, she has to believe him. The younger Naruto was sitting in the hotel room when somebody knocked on the door. The boy gets up and answers the door only to be met with a tall, black-haired man with a matching set of Sharingan eyes. Who is that? Ruby asks quietly, shocking everybody around her. She had rejoined the group, but was keeping a bit of a distance. The others could tell she was still bothered by something, but knew she had to keep her focus on Naruto's story. Naruto sighs, not even needing Jin's powers to remember this moment perfectly. You're about to find out. I learned a little bit more about Sasuke when I met this man. And so, they do. They watch Sasuke appear, Kasame revealed that Itachi killed all of his and Sasuke's family, and finally, that Itachi was, in fact, Sasuke's older brother. That's horrible, Blake says, her eyes wide in shock. Everybody else was equally shocked, with even Ashbin being rendered speechless. How many Uchiha were there? Maria asks carefully. Naruto adopts a thinking pose, well, they were in charge of our police force, being the only shinobi to make it up. With Kanoa being as big as it was, there had to be at least 200, if not closer to 5. That and the fact that not every Uchiha was a ninja, and with some being kids and others being elderly. I'd say anywhere from 1 to 2,000. And he killed all of them? Ruby asks with a shaky voice. Even the, the kids? Naruto sighs heavily. He at the very least killed his and Sasuke's parents. Sasuke saw that himself. But it was revealed much, much later that the masked man that killed my parents also helped Itachi. Ruby looks at Naruto in horror. Before she can even say anything else, Naruto looks down and continues. Itachi wasn't a bad guy. He was ordered to kill the Uchiha. What? Ruby asks breathlessly. Who would? Who could? Who else but the Hokage? Blake says disbelievingly. He ordered it, didn't he? Haruzen ordered it. Naruto shakes his head, eyes watering up. I don't know. When I heard of this, I didn't have time to think about it, but I don't know who else could have ordered him to. Gods, I hope it wasn't Gigi. It couldn't have been. He loved everybody in the village. No, Naruto, it wasn't. Jin says. Nobody had noticed the scene freezing around them, being too caught up in the discussion. He didn't. Naruto asks. No. But he knew about it. The Uchiha were planning the coup, which would have led to thousands of deaths. Itachi told Haruzen about it, and a council between the Hokage and the elders was called. Danzo was the one who ordered this. Haruzen was adamant about finding another, more peaceful way. Danzo, with the other elders' support, 
ordered Itachi to massacre them all anyway. Itachi carried out the massacre out of love for the village. He knew he would suffer for the death of the Uchiha, but also that it had to be done for the sake of the many. A hard decision to make, but he made it all the same. He just couldn't bring himself to kill his little brother. Naruto lets out a sigh of relief, his shoulders relaxing. Jin fades away, the scene playing once again. The group is still reeling in shock, but they know they have time to process this later and slowly bring their attention to the scene playing in front of them. They watch Sasuke's Chidori fail against Itachi. Jiraiya arrives, the woman from earlier slung over his shoulder. Itachi beats Sasuke into submission while Kasame prevents Jiraiya from interfering. Jiraiya summons his toad stomach after Itachi uses the Tsukuyami on Sasuke. It was a shocking and new fighting style to the group. It was equally surprising to everybody that Itachi and Kisame both escape as quickly as they can. There was also some confusion over the black flames that Itachi used to escape, but Naruto was adamant in allowing it to be explained later. Guy arrives with a swift kick to Jiraiya's face, which would have been funny to most of the group from Remnant if they weren't still bathing in the revelation of the Uchiha massacre. The scene changes to Naruto and Jiraiya arriving in the next town. The two split up, with Jiraiya taking all of Naruto's money and Naruto being left to entertain himself. Finally, Naruto reunites with Jiraiya and is shown the Rasengan for the first time. So that's who you learned that move from? Young asks. Naruto nods as Jiraiya explains the first step to his younger self before they get back on the road. Through their travel, Naruto manages to clear the first step rather quickly and begins on the second step. It was days before Naruto was able to make some headway on the second step. He finally manages to make a hole in a rubber ball eventually, leading to Jiraiya finally giving him a clue on how to focus his chakra. It's a little hard to take him seriously when he disappears every day just to go to a whorehouse. Why says frustratedly, throwing her arms up in the air. Naruto sighs, pinching the bridge of his nose. Okay, it's true that he is a perv, again. But there is truly a reason for him doing this. And what could possibly be a good reason for constantly sleeping with multiple women? Yang says with an eye roll. He has the largest spine network in the elemental nations. If something is happening, chances are he knows about it. And honestly, a lot of his spies are service women. Everyone falters at this. What? Weiss asks, her eyes narrowed. They are. It's honestly smart. Like I said, nobody gets secrets from men quite like women. Erosena knew that, and he capitalized on it. He had to play the part, of course. Can't have an extremely famous shinobi visiting brothels and just expect people not to notice. They noticed, but his extremely pervy nature made it almost expected, so people think nothing of it. That man taught me a lot about espionage. He was the best. I think he wanted me to take over the spy network. He taught me all about it. Wait. Young blinks. He taught you how to manage a spine network, the same network that is mostly made up of prostitutes. Did he? Ruby stiffens at this, briefly forgetting about her previous internal conflict. Naruto quickly understands what Young was implying though. He blushes furiously as he tries to defend himself. No. No. He, uh. Oh. Don't you all worry your pretty faces. They hear Jin chuckle out. He is still a virgin. Although there was that one that seemed to have it out for you, Naruto. I'm sure you remember her promise. You are old enough now in your world now. Naruto, who had initially been relieved to hear Jin coming to his defense, glares up at the sky when she outs his sexual life, or lack thereof. When she mentions the promise, however, he gulps as he looks back to Team RW. Why? Weiss, Blake, and Yang all stare at him with raised eyebrows. Ruby's face, however, is completely blank. What kind of promise? Ruby asks, her neutral expression only betrayed by a single eyebrow twitch. Oh, nothing really. Naruto says nervously. Can't even remember. Now you aren't much of a liar, Naruto. Jin's voice echoes around them again. You remember perfectly. She was a very special woman, from the Yuwaka clan if I remember correctly. Yuwaku. Blake repeats questioningly. Ah yes. Jin says excitedly. A clan of mostly women, although there are a few men. They are rather rare in Naruto's time. This clan is able to use a very specific ability that allows them to change their appearance. Unlike the transformation jutsu, however, they are able to innately know who their target, or client in this case, greatest desire isn't perfectly transform into that person. A particular grinding noise causes everybody to look over at Ruby. They see nothing, however, as Ruby quickly schools her face. Ah uh, yes, she told you to come to her when you were ready, isn't that right Naruto? Jin finally says. Ah, enough of that though, back to it. Her voice recedes, leaving the group to their devices as the younger Naruto continues to try his best at the second part of the Rasengan. Eventually, he succeeds, much to the surprise of Jiraiya. Naruto quickly learns from Jiraiya the third part. They continue traveling, eventually making their way to Tanzakagai. While they thought they had a lead about a snake near a temple, whoever it was, was long gone by the time they got there. They eventually found Tsunade with her apprentice Shizen in a restaurant further into the city. 
Jiraiya drops the bomb of the advisors wanting her to be the fifth Hokage, and most people in the group are slightly shocked. Tsunade, as Naruto remembers, denounces the Hokage name and refuses, much to his younger self's aggravation. The fight between the two of them was again just as he remembered, with Tsunade absolutely demolishing him using only one finger. She's kind of a bitch, but I like her. Yang says when she sees her destructive power. Naruto nods, as if he expected it. Yeah, I figured you would, come to think of it, you might want to pay attention to her. Her super strength might be a little similar to your explosion release. Oh, really? Young says, jumping on the balls of her feet. Naruto laughs slightly. Yeah, I'm not really sure how it works though, only that it is kind of about the chakra control. Controlling the chakra, and releasing it at the perfect moment. Maybe if you combine that idea with your own mixture of chakra, it'll be even better. Young looks down at the ground, already thinking of ways to do it. The week goes on, with Naruto getting to know Shizen, and through her, Sanade. He continues training to the best of his ability, with the fate of the village on his back. Tsunade won't become the Hokage unless he masters the Rasengan. Finally, the last day of the week arrives. Naruto wakes up after a rough night of training, only to find himself in bed, with Shizen collapsed on the floor at the foot of it. After waking her up, she panics, quickly getting up to leave, only to be interrupted by Jiraiya coming to the window. It seemed as though Jiraiya was drugged the previous night by Tsunade. After helping Jiraiya recover as much as he can, Shizen quickly asks them to follow her and tells the two of what happened with Tsunade and Orochimaru when they met. Can he really do that? Ruby asks, already thinking about her mom. She had already decided earlier that she should probably wait to think about her personal issues later and was doing her best to stay focused and involved in what was currently happening. No, Naruto says. He can bring them back, but it wouldn't really be life. It would be something in between. The only thing that I have seen bring people back to life has been the Rinnegan and a self-sacrifice. Ruby and Young both look at each other with disappointed looks. Crow sighs behind them in understanding. Jiraiya, Shizen, and Naruto arrive just as Kabuto is about to slice at Sanade. They intervene just in time. Sanade does her best to take Kabuto out but is quickly put out of the fight when Kabuto cuts himself, getting blood all over her. Her hemophobia leaves her absolutely petrified. Orochimaru and Kabuto summon a pair of snakes which Jiraiya and Naruto both try to copy. They both, unfortunately, are unsuccessful, only able to summon Gamakichi and Gamatatsu. Jiraiya and Orochimaru leap towards each other, leaving Naruto and Shizen to fight Kabuto. Oh who? What is that? Yang asks when she sees Jiraiya using his Hari Jaizo. Naruto's eyes light up when he sees what she is asking about. That's it. He thinks to himself. That is one of his signature jutsu, Naruto says. He can use it to extend his hair, harden it to shield him, or eject single strands of hair like Simbon. It's incredibly useful, and it's something that I hope I'm able to recreate when I can. Will you teach it to me? Yang asks with sparkling eyes. The rest of her team and crow sweat drops, knowing of Yang's odd love for her hair. Naruto looks at her for a moment in contemplation. She probably didn't know how special that technique would be to him if he could recreate it, so he wasn't upset by the request, but it did make him think. The only reason he was a sage was because of Jiraiya. He didn't personally teach Naruto Senjutsu, but he paved the way regardless and intended to teach him when he was ready. Naruto was going to be the sage of this world and pass on his teachings, some of which he learned from Jiraiya, like his hope for peace. Why not leave a little piece of Jiraiya with him? Naruto softly smiles at Yang. Absolutely. I'll teach it to all of you if you'd like. Team RWY smiles brightly at him, excited to have something that would actually make their longer hair practical. Going back to the fight between the Sanin and their students, Kabuto was about to strike Sanade. Just before the strike lands, Naruto leaps in between them, letting the fist hit the front of his forehead protector. Naruto's younger self forms a Rasengan as fast as he can before launching himself at Kabuto. Kabuto dodges, forming his chakra scalpels, slicing at Naruto's thigh, causing him to fall to the ground in pain. It looks like it hurt. Yang says, What happened? He cut the muscles under my skin without actually breaking the skin, Naruto explains. They are called chakra scalpels, and now that I am seeing them again, I think something like that would be useful for John or Rin. John could at least heal whatever damage he does, but Rin would be a lot more deadly with him. Team RWY nods in understanding and continues watching. Kabuto starts to kick the younger ninja around, much to RWY's anger. Kabuto continues beating Naruto until Naruto has a chance to block a kick. Naruto pulls himself to his feet slowly before being thrown back towards Sanade. Kabuto takes out a kanai as Naruto stands and makes a shadow clone. He charges, preparing to end Naruto then and there. Naruto raises a hand as Kabuto approaches, before letting the kunai slide between his index and middle finger, cutting through the webbing. Team RWY flinches at the intentional cut while the younger boy wraps his fingers around the base of the kunai in Kabuto's hand, locking him in place. Naruto then holds out his free hand, 
the Shadow Clone using both hands to make a perfectly formed Rasengan. Naruto slams the Rasengan into Kabuto's chest, sending him flying backward in an explosion of chakra. And Nora wanted to touch it, Weiss says blankly. Everybody other than Ruby chuckles. Ruby, however, narrows her eyes. Wait, what did he do? She asks Naruto. Naruto raises an eyebrow, surprised that Ruby saw the swift motion. What do you mean? He asks, wanting her to explain. Kabuto did something with his chakra scalpel. It looked like he hit you in the chest. Everybody else's eyes widen in shock as Naruto gives Ruby a slightly appraising look. Correct, Naruto says as his younger self falls to the ground, shocking everybody present. Naruto starts explaining as Tsunade runs to his younger self's side. He cut the muscles in my heart. My heart basically stopped beating. I guess you can technically say that I died, or at least I would have if Tsunade wasn't there. She really was the best medic of her time. Of her time? Ashman asks. Can you get any better than completely healing a destroyed heart? Even we can't do that. Well, Naruto starts. I wouldn't say that I saw somebody do better, but I would think that she definitely had somebody surpass her. You'll see later, of course. Tsunade continues working on Naruto, trying her hardest to resuscitate him. Finally, just as Tsunade thinks that all hope is lost, Naruto reaches up, finally conscious, and grabs the necklace that Tsunade bit on, claiming he won the bet. Tsunade puts the necklace on Naruto, when suddenly, Orochimaru is flying toward them, a sword coming out of his mouth. He is heading directly for the unconscious Naruto. No. Ruby screams out in fright. Everybody else's eyes widen. Tsunade, seeing the attack, quickly leaps in front of Orochimaru. The sword pierces through Tsunade, causing gasps of shock to emit from everybody. Even Naruto had known that this happened while he was out. Orochimaru wrenches the sword out of Tsunade, gulping it down again. He tells Tsunade that he hadn't wanted to kill her, and she then tells him that she believes that Naruto will one day be Hokage, and is willing to put her life on the line for it. Orochimaru brings the sword forth again, slashing deep into Tsunade's shoulder and lungs, causing her to fall to the ground. Orochimaru once again attempts to kill Naruto, only for Tsunade to take the hit once more. After kicking her away, Orochimaru mocks Tsunade for her hemophobia, only for Tsunade to finally overcome the fear. She stands, an intricate pattern spreading across her forehead and down her cheeks, much to everybody's confusion. She releases her seal, instantly healing all of her wounds, much to everybody's fascination. What is that? Ruby screams out in fascination. The rest of the team nods in excitement. That is Tsunade Sozo Seze, her creation rebirth. Using the ink seal on her forehead, she is able to use the stored-up chakra to make herself regenerate. It shortens her lifespan, but as long as she has chakra to use, she can't die in battle, Naruto explains. That's badass. I need me one of those, Young says with stars in her eyes. Naruto laughs. Doubt you could. It would take an extreme amount of chakra control to even think about doing that. The only people that I could see possibly having enough chakra control are maybe John, Rin, or Oscar. Most likely just John due to his healing affinity. Naruto chuckles as Young pouts, before they continue watching. Tsunade swiftly bites her thumb, swiping the blood on the back of her hand, causing Orochimaru and Jiraiya's eyes to widen. Orochimaru jumps over to Kabuto, and all three of them swiftly form the necessary signs. In huge bursts of smoke, three gigantic creatures are summoned. The group easily recognizes Gamabunta, but needs an introduction from Naruto on the snake and slug. This is literally my worst nightmare, Weiss says with a grimace. Especially the slug. Hey now, Naruto argues. Katsuyu is easily the most versatile summons that I know of. You'll quickly see why. Naruto then frowns, but I would definitely pay attention. This is the last time that all three Sanin will be together. And it will be an epic fight. And so it was. Manda quickly launches himself at Katsuyu, dodging a ball of acidic slime. He wraps Katsuyu up, intent on squeezing the life out of her. Gamabunta slashes at Manda to free the slug summon, only for Manda to dodge and capture the blade in his mouth. Manda keeps tightening his hold on Katsuyu. Just as it seems like she is about to burst, she separates into thousands of smaller selves, allowing Gamabunta to leap back and separate himself from Manda. Manda launches Gamabunta's blade back to him. Gamabunta dodges, causing the blade to land near Katsuyu and Sanade. After a quick warning to Sanade, Jiraiya and Gamabunta use a joint jutsu using fire and toad oil to make a gigantic flamethrower, completely torching Manda and Orochimaru. Whoa, that's a lot of fire. Yang says in awe. Neither Salem nor I could do anything on this scale. Ashpin says in disbelief. Naruto nods, this is what a battle between S-rank ninja is like. And this is with all three of them having major handicaps. If they were all at their best, the battle would be even bigger. I see Orochimaru can't use his arms, and Jiraiya was drugged. But what is Tsunade's handicap? Weiss asks. She hasn't been an active ninja in years. At least nine, if not more. On top of that, she had to use a lot of her chakra to heal me and herself. 
Had she not had to deal with the hemophobia, it would be a different story altogether. What Jiraiya had thought was Manda actually turned out to be his shed skin. Manda burst from the ground behind Gamabunta, only to be impaled by Gamabunta's sword. Tsunade had picked it up herself, wielding it as though it wasn't many times bigger than her. Damn, Crow says with wide eyes. Wouldn't want to piss her off? Naruto chuckles, thinking of all the times he did exactly that. What follows can only be described as an absolute beating. Sanade punches and kicks Orochimaru around with seemingly no effort. Even when she falters due to approaching her limit, she pushes past it, determined to end Orochimaru then and there. Regardless of that, however, Orochimaru and Kabuto manage to make a quick getaway, leaving three exhausted ninja and one unconscious one. Interesting, Naruto says with a hum. What is? Blake asks. Naruto shakes his head. I just didn't know that Granny went to those lengths to save me. It's nice to know in a way. The scene fades to black again, changing to Sanade inside Sasuke's room to heal him. She then goes to heal Kakashi and chastises him, much to the masked ninja's embarrassment. Finally, was Lee, and though Naruto wasn't there for it, he knew how it went. The group watches solemnly as Sanade tells him of the success rate and subsequent mortality rate of the procedure. That's awful, Ruby says with a frown. To have your biggest dream snatched away from you in a split second. Yeah, Naruto says sadly. The scene fades to black once again, with Jin appearing in front of them. There is quite a bit that happens from this point up until Naruto here leaves the village for a training trip. However, due to the amount of time this is all taking, I will only be showing you one more mission before the training trip. Naruto, I'm assuming that you know what I speak of. Naruto sighs but nods in understanding. Everybody else looks at Naruto in slight confusion but refrains from asking any questions. They have quickly learned that oftentimes when they want to ask a question, it is soon to be answered anyway. Now, Jin starts. The next part takes place after a rough mission that Team 7 was a part of. Sasuke ended up needing to stay in the hospital again, and he finds himself conflicted with his growth. He believes that he isn't getting strong enough to kill Itachi quickly enough. She disappears, and the scene around them changes to the hospital room that Sasuke was currently residing in. Sakura and Naruto were visiting him. Sakura was offering Sasuke a piece of an apple when he suddenly slaps it out of her hand, sending it and the entire plate with the rest of the apple across the room. Dick, Young says with a scowl. Naruto lets out a small smile, thinking of how similar he and Young were in these situations. They watch as Sasuke glares at Naruto before demanding that they fight each other. He steps out of the bed, demanding a fight with Naruto's younger self, egging him on as much as he is able. They walk out of the room towards the roof as Sakura looks between the two nervously. They finally arrive on the roof, walking into a clear area. They face each other, preparing themselves for the fight. They exchange a few words taunting each other as much as they can before exchanging fists. Finally, they dash towards each other, exchanging blow after blow. Naruto appears to have the upper hand, then Sasuke. It quickly becomes impossible to tell who is likely to win this fight. Naruto's younger self creates multiple shadow clones, preparing to blitz Sasuke. Sasuke does his best to defend against the attack, but ultimately gets kicked into the air as Naruto prepares to hit him with his barrage. Sasuke dodges as he finishes some seals, ending on the tiger seal. Sasuke lets loose a huge storm of fire on the clones down below, causing everybody to cover their eyes. As they peer into the blaze, they see two figures. The two figures are quickly revealed to be Naruto and another clone forming a Rasengan. In response to the unknown jutsu, Sasuke forms his own Chidori. Naruto leaps up towards him as Sasuke falls, the two preparing to connect their A-rank techniques. Jaws tense all around in anticipation. This is the first time they have seen the two Jinin fight each other, and it definitely seems to be a close one. You guys are going too far, Ruby says lowly. Naruto nods in understanding, but doesn't reply. Just moments before their collision, Sakura runs out into the clearing yelling for them to stop. Both boys' eyes widen as the two of them realize just how far they have taken this fight. Unable to stop, the two continue on their path of collision, both of them furiously thinking of ways to stop, but unable to. Right before they collide, a hand clasps around each of their wrists. Kakashi appears between them, and with barely a strain, twists around sending the two Jin and barreling into separate water towers. Kakashi admonishes the two in his own laid-back manner as they recover from their fight. Sasuke seems pleased with the effects of his Chidori compared to Naruto's. He leaps away, the group leaning over the railing to see him leave. They watch as Sasuke sees the true extent of the Rasengan's power at the rear of the water tower that Naruto struck. The scene changes to Sasuke sitting on top of a tree in a different part of the village. Naruto perks up, as he, of course, wasn't present for this. Kakashi makes a swift entrance, tying Sasuke to the tree with ninja wire, and landing in front of him. Kakashi starts by telling Sasuke that he should give up thoughts about revenge. Everybody present raises an eyebrow, hoping that Kakashi has more to say to convince Sasuke. 
Seeking revenge on the man that killed your family is not a goal that many of them could see giving up so easily. Kakashi tells him that people seeking revenge rarely have good endings, only for Sasuke to interrupt. Sasuke proposes that he go and kill the person closest to Kakashi so that he would understand. Well, I guess you could do something like that, Kakashi says casually. Unfortunately, they're all already dead. Sasuke's eyes widen in shock as everybody else looks at the two sadly. Both of us, Kakashi says with a sigh. We aren't the lucky ones, that's for damn sure. But we also aren't the worst. Sasuke looks up at him, his anger gone as he thinks on Kakashi's words. We have people dear to us. Our comrades, Kakashi says. That's why I taught you the Chidori, because you have something important to you now. Well spoken, Ashpin says, with Maria and Crow nodding. It's still sad to think of though, Ruby says forlornly, thinking of her own mother. So many people lose the people they care about. Kakashi leaves Sasuke on these words, and the scene changes once again. Naruto, Shikamaru, Niji, Choji, and Kiba are all at the front gates, preparing for a mission. The older Naruto quickly informs them of what happened. Of course, Wise says furiously. He just leaves anyway. I know we knew it was coming, but after seeing that Orochimaru creep, it just feels all kinds of wrong. Yeah, Young agrees. That guy seems to like young boys a little too much. Naruto chokes on his own spit, struggling to rein his laugh in. After making a formation plan and checking their equipment, the team prepares to head out, only to be stopped by Sakura's arrival. She begs Naruto to bring Sasuke back, causing him to, of course, make the promise that would eventually lead him to his death, not that anybody knew that at the time. The team finally departs, all determined to bring back their friend. The team continues onward for quite some time, avoiding many traps and rapidly closing in on the enemy. Finally, they find the enemy up ahead with the help of Niji's Biakugan. They make a plan to ambush the sound for, but ultimately fall into a trap. They find themselves entrapped in a dome of rock that slowly eats at their chakra. After some good planning by Shikamaru, they escape the dome. They engage with Jirobo for a while, getting hopelessly beaten around the whole time. Despite the plan for half of them to stay and deal with Jirobo, Choji eventually makes the decision to fight Jirobo by himself, telling the others to go ahead. The others quickly depart, leaving the large sound ninja to Choji. They continue chasing the rest of the sound four, carving out signs for Choji to follow once he was finished with his opponent. It's good that you have faith in him, Ashpin says with an approving nod. Next, they run into Kadamura next. Once again, it was decided that one would stay behind so that the others could catch up to Sasuke and the last two sound ninja. Niji makes the decision to stay behind this time, feeling that he would be the best opponent for Kadamaru. Naruto, Kiba, and Shikamaru spend the rest of that day and night traveling. Once they knew they were close, they decide to attack in the morning. Morning comes, and they ambush Tayuya and Sakan. They were successful in separating them from the coffin and make a quick getaway. Unfortunately, as Akimaru was setting traps for the two ninja chasing them, he gets caught by Sakan as an explosive tag is set to go off next to him. Kiba jumps in to save his partner, blowing all three of them into a ravine. Shikamaru and Naruto have no time to worry about this, however. Tayuya was beelining straight for them. Just before she can reach them, she freezes. Looking behind them, they see Kimamaro for the first time. Kimamaro makes quick work of separating Naruto and Shikamaru from the coffin that Sasuke was inside of. He looks scary, Ruby says, a shiver running down her spine. Yeah, Naruto says, rubbing the back of his head. Just wait till you see what he can do. Naruto chases after Kimamaro, leaving Shikamaru to face Tayuya by himself. They reach a clearing, and the two start fighting, with Naruto beginning to leak Karama's chakra out of anger. Wait, Ruby says in disbelief. That sword, is that? Yep, Naruto says with a nod. You. Ruby screams in disgust, confusing everybody else. Just as they are about to ask, though, Kimamaro finishes his willow dance, impaling multiple clones with bones sticking from multiple different joints. No way. Young cries out in disbelief. Yeah, it was a little gross, but nothing compared to this, Naruto says as he points out Kimamaro taking his sharpened humerus out of his arm. Shivers run throughout the group. Kimamaro definitely had the upper hand at this point, thwarting all of Naruto's attempts to beat him. The coffin suddenly started sizzling, the seals holding the top in place dissolve into dust, releasing Sasuke. When the smoke from the release clears, they look at Sasuke, only to find that he looks different. His hair is gray, and his skin has a darker tone to it. Just when Naruto's younger self starts trying to convince Sasuke to go back to the leaf with him, Sasuke starts laughing. Naruto recoils at the coldness of the laugh, and Sasuke leaps away. When Naruto attempts to follow his teammate, Kimamaro moves to stop him, only to be interrupted by Lee. Hey, looks like that surgery worked. Yang yells out excitedly. The rest of her team nods in agreement, happy to see Lee back to his former self. Leaving Kimamaro to Lee, Naruto begins chasing after Sasuke, still determined to fulfill his promise to Sakura. 
Finally, after what seemed like ages, Naruto sees Sasuke leaping across the waterfall of the Valley of the End. Sasuke was atop Madara Uchiha's head, and Naruto quickly screeches to a stop at Hashirama Senju's head. Whoa, Young says in awe, her jaw dropping at the massive statues. The statue that I'm on is the statue of our first Hokage, Hashirama Senju, Naruto explains. And the other one is Hashirama's closest friend, greatest rival, and first traitor of Kanoha, Madara Uchiha. Ironic, Ashpin says with a smirk. A boy who wants to be Hokage, and his rival, friend, and unfortunately, traitor. Naruto nods sadly. Yeah, I thought so too. Naruto's younger self cries out to Sasuke, causing him to stop and turn around. Oh, why says with a grimace. That doesn't look good. And she was right. The entire left side of Sasuke's face was covered in the curse mark, and his left eye looked like the eye of a monster. Sasuke tells Naruto that he has no more interest in Kanoha, and that Naruto should simply go home. Naruto, thinking back on how everybody had risked their lives to get Sasuke back, and how Sakura had pleaded with him to do the same, was infuriated with Sasuke's nonchalance. Sasuke turns around, intent on leaving Naruto there, only for Naruto to leap towards him. Naruto's younger self slams Sasuke to the ground before clenching his fist and landing a hit directly on Sasuke's cheek. Sasuke makes no sound or expression to show that the hit affected him, only turning back to face the other young boy and spitting a glob of blood directly in his face. Ew, Ruby says as a simple response. Everybody else nods, the rest of Team RWY adopting squeamish looks on their faces. Ashpin and Crow have small smiles on their faces at the silliness of their reactions. Sasuke taunts Naruto, explaining that he wasn't getting stronger with his so-called comrades in the village. He wanted to go to Orochimaru, and he was going to get stronger. The younger Naruto explains to Sasuke that Orochimaru simply wanted to use Sasuke as a vessel for his next reanimation and didn't truly care about Sasuke getting stronger at all. Everybody's eyes widen in shock when Sasuke says he doesn't care. As long as his goal is complete, nothing else matters. Naruto continues talking to Sasuke, trying to convince him to come back, telling him that if he has to, he will even take Sasuke back by force. Sasuke, rather than respond to Naruto, begins laughing. At Naruto's confusion, Sasuke says that Naruto was laughing the last time they fought too. They now had a chance to fight again. This isn't the kind of fight I wanted, Naruto's younger self says. Even now, I don't care about what bothers you, Sasuke says before slowly pushing Naruto off of him. The younger Naruto strains, unable to stop Sasuke from moving him. Sasuke slowly stands, lifting Naruto off the ground by his jumpsuit. With a smirk, Sasuke lets go, winding up a fist and burying it in Naruto's gut. Ribs crack as Naruto spits up blood and is sent sailing halfway across the waterfall, into the raging rapids. No way, Weiss yells out. He did that almost effortlessly. The rest of her team nods with wide eyes. It looked like this was going to be a groundbreaking fight already. Both Naruto and Sasuke would be pushing their limits to win. Naruto finally pulls himself out of the water. Naruto and Sasuke glare at each other for a moment, before they dash toward each other, Naruto scaling Madara's monument, with Sasuke free-falling to meet him. Sasuke dodges a strike from Naruto, sending a kick to his face. As Naruto falls, Sasuke steals the bag of supplies from his hip. Naruto draws himself out of the water once more, launching a shuriken out of his thigh holster and hurling it at Sasuke. Sasuke responds by launching a kunai directly at Naruto's head. He's actually trying to kill you, Ruby says in shock as the younger Naruto takes cover behind a rock. I threw a shuriken at him too. Naruto says in response. You weren't aiming at his head. You aimed center mass, and you chose a weapon that is less likely to kill, Ashpin says grimly. It may not seem like it in the heat of battle, Mr. Uzumaki, but there is a distinct difference. Naruto sighs as Sasuke launches two more kanai at the boulder Naruto's younger self was hiding behind, using the second one to redirect the first, changing its course directly towards Naruto's head. Ruby gasps in fright as the kunai lands directly under Naruto's headband, burying itself to the hilt. Everybody looks at the preteen Naruto in horror before he bursts into smoke. Those shadow clones are going to give us all a heart attack someday. You'd think we would just expect this by now, Weiss sighs out in relief. Ruby glares at Naruto and slaps his shoulder in frustration. Ouch! Naruto shouts out. What did I do? You scared me half to death. Ruby yells back, a twitch developing in her eyebrow. He is definitely trying to kill you. And you're lucky I already know that he doesn't. Naruto stares at her in slight fear at her ranting. Ruby folds her arms in frustration before returning her focus on the fight, shoulders tense with restrained emotion. This really bothers her, Naruto realizes. I guess I'm going to have to have a talk with her later. She is having a rougher time with things than I realized. Naruto sighs in acceptance as everybody else looks between the two of them cautiously. Ruby has been steadily getting more and more emotional throughout this reenactment of Naruto's life. Everybody but Maria knew her well enough to have an idea as to why. 
Ruby has had to fight for her life on multiple occasions, but mostly with Grimm, and when against other people, never as often as Naruto seems to have just within the first six months of his ninja career. And it has already been alluded that they are only seeing the most important parts of Naruto's life. He was bound to have had more dangerous missions and terrifying experiences. It was hard for most of them to believe. Even the three hardened hunters and huntress were slightly off-put by the sheer chaos that was Naruto's life. Everyone is torn from their thoughts as Naruto and Sasuke's past selves continue their fight. Sasuke attaches ninja wire to multiple shuriken as Naruto leaps from behind the boulder. He throws them at Naruto, wrapping the wire around the rocks and binding Naruto to them. Sasuke places the wires in his mouth, staring boredly at Naruto. He says a few words of discouragement to Naruto, before forming four distinct hand seals, stopping on the tiger. Katan, Ryuken no Jutsu. Fire style, Dragon Flame Jutsu. Sasuke calls out, biting the wire firmly between his teeth. No. Y says disbelievingly, remembering this jutsu from their fight with Orochimaru. They all remember how it melted off the Sanin's fake layer of flesh. Ruby and her teammates all grimace, as the red-cloaked huntress bites the nail of her thumb. Sasuke lets forth an enormous amount of fire. The fire travels down the ninja wire, completely encompassing Naruto's younger self. Team RWY cringes, half expecting to hear Naruto's screams of pain from inside the flames. Just as they thought that Naruto had lost the fight, he burst from within the flames, leaping towards Sasuke and striking him in the face as hard as he can. How did you survive that? Blake says in shock. That should have killed you. Yeah, Young agrees with wide eyes. You did something similar in your other fight with him. If you had aura then that would make sense, but you don't. So shocked they all are, that they completely miss the quiet sigh of relief from Ruby, who finally frees her thumbnail from the nervous clutches of her teeth. Naruto shrugs in response as his younger self lays blow after blow into Sasuke, hardly making him move an inch. I'm not sure. It's hard to say in the heat of the moment. With the first fight, I'm pretty sure that making the Rasengan forced the fire away from me. This time, I know that I substituted myself with a clone that was still behind the rock. Going through the fire though, I'm guessing I just coated myself in a bunch of chakra and made something like an aura shield on my own. Amazing, Ashpin says in awe. The things you can do with chakra. I would have never thought to use my magic in such a way. The energy may be the same, but you shinobi have truly taken it a step further, haven't you? Sasuke throws Naruto off the edge of Madara's head, jumping after him. He plants multiple kicks into Naruto's stomach, propelling him further and eventually causing him to slam into the ground. When the dust clears, Naruto is halfway buried in the ground. Sasuke scoffs at his teammate's lackluster performance, taunting him further as he tosses Naruto's supply bag onto the ground. Naruto struggles to his feet, grabbing his bag and strapping it to his belt again. Sasuke and Naruto stare each other down as Sasuke invites him to fight more. Sasuke activates his Sharingan, and both opponents tense. Naruto creates multiple shadow clones, and the two, as well as the clones, charge toward each other. Sasuke systematically dispels each clone with well-placed strikes. Sasuke, being left with only one Naruto, appears in front of the boy, grabbing his wrist. He launches an uppercut at Naruto, followed by a swift kick. He sends Naruto flying through the air and follows up with a quick fireball, creating a bigger inferno than even the Ryuka. The flames disperse after a while, showing Sasuke staring into the tree lean, with Naruto hiding behind one of said trees, catching his breath. Why do I feel like this is just the start? Ruby asks sadly. Naruto nods, because it is. Naruto's younger self finally reveals himself to Sasuke, only for the Uchiha to charge directly at him. The two leap into the air, Naruto trying to escape with Sasuke hot on his tail. Sasuke sends a barrage of strikes Naruto's way. The last strike connects with Naruto's chest. Sasuke buries his fist in Naruto's chest, causing even more ribs to crack and sending Naruto sailing over the waterfall and into the river below. Naruto sinks down to the riverbed as Sasuke watches and waits. Naruto, losing his breath, struggles to the top. He glares at Sasuke for a while, before finally speaking. Do you not even see me as a teammate anymore? Naruto yells up at him. Didn't all of those times together on Team 7 mean anything? No, Sasuke says, surprising everybody present. It wasn't meaningless. You became my best friend. Best friend? Naruto's younger self echoes. Then why? There's more meaning in taking you down, Sasuke says with a dull tone. I don't get it, Naruto says. But I understand that you want to fight me with everything you have. The two dash towards each other once again, ready to continue their fight. I don't like this, Ruby says sadly. This isn't supposed to be how friends treat each other. Naruto can do nothing to reassure her. He knows that most people seeing this fight between Naruto and Sasuke would resent Sasuke for what he did but Naruto just felt as though he knew Sasuke better than most. The two leap at each other, meeting in the middle and blocking each other's punches. Being on a vertical surface, Sasuke releases the chakra to his feet, 
allowing himself to fall as he quickly digs a kunai out of Naruto's supply bag. As he falls, he throws the kunai at Naruto, only for Naruto to counter with a well-placed shuriken. Having reattached himself to the wall, Sasuke kicks Naruto away from the surface of the wall, leaping away and forming a chidori. He is still willing to use it against a teammate? Did he learn nothing last time? Why says exasperatedly. To be fair, I used it first in our last fight, Naruto argues for Sasuke. Everyone present stares at Naruto deadpan and clearly unamused. With a nervous chuckle, he motions back to the fight. Down on the surface of the water, Naruto responds by making a shadow clone and quickly forming a Rasengan. Sasuke falls, landing on the water and rushing towards Naruto as fast as he can. Naruto responds in kind, having his clone launch him towards Sasuke. The water around them is forced away as their attacks meet. The power struggle between the Chidori and Rasengan shows no immediate victor. Finally, the chakra destabilizes, sending both ninja flying away from each other. Sasuke rises from the water first, anger from the result of his Chidori easily visible. Naruto floats to the surface face up. This is going too far, Blake says worriedly. The younger Naruto turns from his face up position to stare at Sasuke sadly. What's with the look? Young asks Naruto. Naruto sighed, that was when I realized he was trying to kill me. The curse seal spreads across Sasuke's body as Naruto struggles out of the water. They exchange a few more words before Sasuke stands up, flowing through more hand signs. Katan, Hosenka no Jutsu. Fire style, Phoenix Flower Jutsu. Sasuke yells out, spitting multiple miniature balls of flame from his mouth, directly at Naruto. Naruto leaps above the balls of fire, only for Sasuke to appear directly next to him, landing a kick directly to his jaw. Back with the group, Ruby gasps in shock. Everybody else looks to her, wondering if she once again saw something that nobody else did. What is it, Rubes? Young asks hurriedly. I couldn't see, Ruby says, her eyes widened in shock. What? Blake asks confused. Ruby gulps, I couldn't see him move. He's faster than my eyes can see. This comes as a shock to everybody. Though Ashbin could still see their movement due to his overall experience with fighting, even he was having a hard time tracking Sasuke. This worried him slightly as both these boys were still only six months into their profession. He wonders just how fast Naruto is now, or even with Kurama. Though Jin had already answered that question, seeing it was something entirely different. The rest of the team gulps as Ruby looks to Naruto, her eyes still wide as saucers. He was this fast at 12? Were you able to keep up? Naruto shrugs slightly. I'm able to keep up just a bit. Later on I think I actually outdo him in speed. This fight was mostly just to have the most power-ups. A little ridiculous in hindsight. Ruby nods absent-mindedly before turning back to the fight. She would have a lot of improving to do if this was just the start of what Naruto and Sasuke were able to do. Naruto falls into the water once again. Just as he drags himself out, Sasuke rushes forward, not wasting a second. He buries a fist in Naruto's gut once again, followed by a fist to the face. He grabs his jumpsuit, quickly forming another Chidori. Oh no. Ruby shouts out. You don't have anything to defend against it. Weiss grinds out in anticipation. Just as it looks like Sasuke is going to hit Naruto with it, Red Chakra begins spilling out and around Naruto. Though this chakra comes with a cold feeling in their gut, the group is happy to see its appearance. There seems to be hope for Naruto yet. Sasuke pushes his Chidori forward, plunging it directly through Naruto's chest. R.W.Y. gasps in shock, and even the adult's eyes widen. Ruby quickly covers her mouth with her hands, fighting an involuntary scream. You didn't dodge it? Block it? Nothing? Crow says with a rushed tone. It had looked like Naruto had a chance for a moment. Though she managed to stop her scream, tears swell in Ruby's eyes. They just so happened to be directly behind Naruto and Sasuke. So when Sasuke removed his hand, she could see the blue of Sasuke's shirt through the hole in Naruto's chest. Blood began dripping through the hole, traveling down Naruto's arm and into the water. Sasuke flicks his blood-soaked hand, ridding it of the blood, before gripping Naruto's neck, intending to drain the rest of his life out of him. As Sasuke begins squeezing, Kurama's chakra makes a comeback, spreading quickly around Naruto again. Naruto grips Sasuke's hand, removing it from his throat. Naruto tightens, threatening to break Sasuke's arm, causing him to leap back to escape. You are still fighting even after that boy put a hole for your chest? Maria says, seemingly unfazed by the gory sight. He really tried to kill you, Ruby says in disbelief, wiping away the tears from her eyes. And you still wanted to save him? Naruto nodded resolutely, causing Ruby to shake her head in disbelief. She cherished all of her friends, but to this extent? She didn't know if she could do that. Thankfully for Ruby, the wound in Naruto's chest began closing rapidly before her eyes, setting her at ease, slightly. I'm not going to let Orochimaru take you away. The younger blonde yells out. I'll bring you back, even if I have to break every bone in your arms and legs. Naruto punches the air, creating a shockwave of air. It displaces the water and knocks Sasuke off balance. Holy shit. Young yells out. 
You punched the ear hard enough to make it move like that? Nobody bothered trying to correct her language, too focused on the amazing feat in front of them. Naruto dashes towards Sasuke, planting a fist in his gut, followed by four more, and lastly a kick to the jaw. Sasuke skids across the water, slowly drawing himself back to his feet. He looks up suddenly, trying to find Naruto's current location, only for Naruto to be right on top of him, slamming him deep into the depths of the river. Naruto lets out a yell as Sasuke breaks the surface, attempting to gain distance between the two. Naruto stares at his retreating figure for a moment before disappearing from sight. So fast. Ruby says in awe. Even faster than Sasuke. And she was right. Naruto appeared in front of Sasuke, knocking him back towards the center of the river. While on his back, Sasuke sees Naruto rapidly approaching from the air. Flying through hand signs, Sasuke launches a fireball directly at Naruto. Naruto breathes in a deep breath before expelling the air with his own chakra, creating a roar-filled gust of air. The fire dissipates without any challenge. The shockwave causes massive waves to spread across the water. Sasuke struggles to keep himself above water, only for Naruto to slam him into its depths once again. Sasuke immediately begins swimming up, only for Naruto to barrage him from under the water. They both burst through the surface simultaneously. Sasuke is forced to block an axe kick from Naruto, sending him back down towards the water. Rather than allowing this, however, Naruto quickly grabs Sasuke by both the ankles, using the built momentum and spinning him furiously before releasing him. You're destroying him, Yang says with her mouth hanging open. Even she wasn't sure she could fight one-on-one -on -one against Naruto at this point in time, much less as he is now. Sasuke slams into a rock wall, temporarily losing consciousness. As Naruto looms over him, Sasuke quickly comes to, grabbing Naruto and sending them over the edge of the rock wall, back to the water. The rest of Naruto's supplies fall out of his pouch as both Naruto and Sasuke land on two separate logs, kicking them up and balancing on them perfectly. Well, why starts with an uncertain face? That looks a little dramatic. Naruto, despite the tense atmosphere, lets out a chuckle. This was history to him. All emotions he had related to this were settled upon his death. The rest of the group was stressed about the fight, but this was just another memory to him. After a heartfelt exchange of words, Sasuke lets loose a small burst of chakra from his feet, splitting the log into multiple pieces. As he lands on top of the water, he grabs a splintered piece of wood and shoots it at Naruto's own log, splitting it as well. They are able to see a third Tomo appear in each of Sasuke's eyes. The two run towards each other once again, only now, Sasuke seems to be able to respond to Naruto's attacks. Sasuke once again has the upper hand. Though the group isn't able to follow their movements, it is obvious that Sasuke is landing more blows on Naruto than the other way around. The brawl goes from the water surface to the rock face, before a decisive punch from Sasuke sends Naruto back into the water. Sasuke leaps down to the water surface, content on waiting for Naruto to resurface. When he does, he does so with multiple shadow clones, all shooting at him from the water like a torpedo. Sasuke twists and turns, destroying clone after clone. Just when everything settles and Sasuke believes that the barrage is over, he feels two hands wrap around his ankles. Sasuke is dragged along for a ride as a ladder of clones emerges from the river, slinging Sasuke around and smashing him into the cliff face once again. Damn. Surprisingly, it's Blake that says this. You're definitely not getting away with not teaching me that. Naruto smirks as the fight continues. A blast of fire emerges from the smoke cloud, traveling along the ladder of clones, dispelling each of them. Sasuke gasps for breath as he feels his ankles being released. The flames clear away, showing that the Naruto who grabbed Sasuke was, in fact, the real one. Sasuke looks at the smoking orange-clad ninja in shock before coming to his senses and grabbing Naruto. I already told you that it's too late, Naruto. He throws Naruto toward the rocky shore, grabbing him midair and wrapping his legs around his neck. Cringes and gasps roll through the group as Naruto is slammed into Rock's head first. He is going to kill you, Ruby says with a sniffle. He is. Naruto says with a nod, causing Ruby to look at him. Just not today, but you need to get ready to see it. I'm sure it wasn't a pretty sight, and I doubt Jin won't show it to us. Ruby takes a deep breath before nodding in acceptance. As sad as it was, she couldn't change it. Once again, she reminds herself. I asked the question. I need to deal with it. Naruto rolls into the water, gently floating away. The scene changes, with Naruto floating in the water in front of the fox's cage. Kurama chuckles at the unconscious boy, mocking his weakness. They are suddenly back in the valley of the end. Red chakra begins bubbling around Naruto, cloaking him in an even denser chakra. Naruto slowly rises as Sasuke walks toward him in confusion. Naruto's head snaps forward as he punches Sasuke square on the lips. If they thought that Kurama's chakra was malicious before, it was outright suffocating now. It feels so much worse. Blake says with a shiver, the temporary view of the large canine fox not helping in any way. I didn't think it could get any worse, Weiss says in shock. 
Ruby looks sympathetically toward Naruto. She knows that he hasn't been treated the best due to Kurama and didn't want him to think that RWY would be the same. Looking at him, though, she can tell that Naruto is understanding. Sasuke lands on top of the water, writhing in pain as Naruto looks at himself in confusion. Pain soon overcomes Naruto's face as the chakra begins burning him. He sends another wave of chakra out, causing a wave of water to distract Sasuke. Sasuke attempts to recover his balance, only for Naruto to appear right next to him, a swipe of his clawed hand sending Sasuke even further away. The Uchiha recovers on top of another log as he analyzes Naruto's newfound strength. They burst into action once again, Sasuke launching miniature fireballs at Naruto, while Naruto effortlessly dodges them. Suddenly Naruto redirects his course, heading straight for Sasuke. Sasuke responds by sending a full-sized fireball at Naruto, only for Naruto to tank it effortlessly. Naruto begins to enhance his unpredictable fighting style by using Kurama's chakra as extended limbs, reaching for Sasuke and slamming him around effortlessly. Just as Sasuke catches a moment to himself on the shoreline, an enormous hand of red chakra appears from under the water, ready to smash into him. Now it looks like you're the one trying to kill him, Young comments nonchalantly. Naruto nods. I probably was. Kurama's chakra enhances my aggression when we aren't synced. It can get to the point where I'm not even able to tell friend from foe after I'm exposed to enough of it. They watch as Sasuke leans against a rock, having successfully dodged the giant hand. The curse mark spreads across Sasuke's body. With a chuckle, the curse mark spreads completely, changing Sasuke's skin tone to an off-putting gray, his hair following suit, and a dark black diamond takes shape on the bridge of his nose. Naruto charges at Sasuke once more, a single clawed hand dragging behind him. He swipes at Sasuke, dragging him across the cliff and into Madara's foot. When the dust settles, Naruto's younger self and the others are shocked to see a grotesque hand-shaped wing had blocked the blow. Large fingers connected by a webbing made of smaller ones. That's disgusting. Why says with a cringe. The rest of her team nods in agreement, all of their faces greener than usual. Sasuke flings the wing slash hand forward, sending Naruto flying across the river and into Hashirama's leg. Everybody looks at Sasuke in shock as a second hand bursts from his back. A smirk plastered on his face showing everybody what he thinks of his current situation. Suddenly he winces, the pain from the curse mark making its first appearance. It seems it isn't without its drawbacks, however, Blake intones. Naruto nods before pointing at his younger self, who was just starting to stand, his left arm hanging weakly at his side. He isn't the only one. What's wrong? Ruby asks worriedly as Sasuke continues to taunt Naruto. The chakra of the cloak burns at my skin, Naruto says. Kurama's chakra is extremely dense, and because of that, toxic to most things. I was able to increase my tolerance for it as time went on, but it wasn't until I took the chakra and made it my own, and later synced with Kurama, that I was able to get around its harmful nature. That sounds awful. Ruby yells out. The rest of the group nods, with Crow looking particularly bothered. Burns your skin. Crow starts to ask. Even. He finishes off with a wiggle of his finger, not wanting to state it out loud. Naruto chuckles as Team RWY all make noises of disgust. Just as he is about to return his attention to the fight, pure silence from the group causes him to stare at them in confusion. Well, does it? Young asks as everybody else levels disturbingly curious stares at him. Naruto recoils in shock at the serious question. The stairs make it obvious that it would be difficult to escape the situation without an answer. Ah, oh, I, well? Naruto stutters out, trying to find a way to answer without revealing the truth. Finally, he gives up. Fine. Yes, it burns all of my skin. Crow stares at him in horror, and even Ashpin appears to be mildly uncomfortable. Ouch, kid, that's rough. No man should ever. Well, does it still what? Of course it still works, you butthole. Naruto yells at the rough-voiced man. A quick glance at the red-faced team or W.Y., and the amused looks on all of the adults causes him to huff in an annoyance and quickly turn his attention back to the fight. The two teens have been staring at each other ominously. Finally, Sasuke quickly forms the now-familiar signs of the Chidori, sickly black lightning forming in his hand as the technique is empowered by his curse mark. Naruto, his left arm still uselessly hanging at his side, forms his first Rasengan without the help of any clones. The red chakra of his cloak mixes in with the ball of chakra, enhancing his own technique as well. The two leap towards each other, each yelling the other's name, determined to succeed in their goal. Naruto to bring his friend back, and Sasuke to escape the leaf and gain the strength he needs to kill Itachi. The two clash, and a ball of dark purple chakra encompasses the two shinobi. Tom slows to a crawl as Jin appears. I'm going to allow you all to see what happens inside. You need to be able to form your own opinions about this event. And what happens in this last second is important for that. Naruto nods, remembering what happened. The rest of the group looks between the two in confusion. The ball of chakra suddenly appears transparent. With time having been slowed, they quickly see what the genie was talking about. 
Naruto breaks the connection, allowing his Rasengan to disperse. Sasuke's lightning-covered hand, now unimpeded, reaches for Naruto's chest, right over his heart. While Naruto knows what happened, the rest of the group tenses, expecting a repeat of what happened earlier. They all sigh in slight relief as Sasuke clenches his hand to a fist in the last second. Naruto, having released his Rasengan, instead swipes at Sasuke's headband, having been told earlier that he wouldn't put a single scratch on it. A single deep scratch is now etched onto the headband. Time resumes to normal speed, and the purple ball of chakra swells, quickly turning black, then white. The ball of chakra becomes so bright that the whole group of onlookers has to cover their eyes. When the light dies down, they look, only to find Naruto unconscious at Hashirama's feet, with Sasuke standing over him. The chakra-enhanced punch to the chest seemed to have knocked Naruto out. Sasuke stares down at Naruto for a moment, his headband coming undone, landing by Naruto's head. A sudden wave of pain brings Sasuke to his knees. He fights through it, eventually continuing to stare at Naruto. Finally, he gets up, leaping away from the valley. Not even moments after this, Kakashi and his summon dog, Pakin, arrive and quickly move towards Naruto. After staring at Naruto's unconscious figure, Kakashi grabs Sasuke's headband, places it on Naruto's chest, and picks Naruto up. The scene changes, and Kakashi is leaping through the forest with Naruto on his back. Medical ninja appear around them as Naruto wakes up. Kakashi informs them that Sasuke has escaped and quickly asks about the other's conditions. Naruto learns that while Shikamaru and Kiba are alright, Choji and Niji have life-threatening injuries. This isn't where Niji dies, right? Ruby asks worriedly, knowing that something like that would have destroyed Naruto at such a young age. Fortunately, no, Naruto says, similarly knowing that he was lucky that none of his friends passed on this mission. The scene changes once again, showing Choji in his hospital room, wrapped in sealing paper, a nurse next to him scribbling furiously on the paper. Sonate herself was behind a huge book, reading and mixing ingredients. What's that? Weiss asks curiously. Though the situation looks dire, they allow themselves the ability to be curious, since they know that none of Naruto's friends die on this mission. Not too sure, but if I had to guess, I'd say it's either the Akimichi clan book or at least the book detailing the pills he took, Naruto says with a shrug. It's huge, Blake notes. Hard to believe that they can have that much information, even for their clan. Naruto nods, clans are proud of their history and make sure to document everything they can for situations like this. Their documentation is probably the only reason that Choji survived. While the adults already know the importance of information, Team RWB nods from the useful piece of information. Next, they see Kiba lying in a bed, his sister looking over Akimaru. Both appear to be in bad shape, but reassurance from Hana quickly sets them at ease. Then there was Niji. He was surrounded by an intricate eight-point seal. A lock of his own hair was bundled above a hole in his chest. Enormous amounts of chakra were being funneled through four mednin on four of the corners of the seal. Upon quick observation, they see that while the mednins are at the corners of the square, Shizen herself is at the bottom of the diamond. She is easily supplying the most chakra to the seal, a near-empty bag of food pills at her side. A comment from one of the ninjas switching in another corner tells them that they have been at this process for at least three hours. This is so confusing, Weiss says. What is going on? Naruto yells out, Jin? Can you pause it? Time once again slows to a crawl, before stopping altogether. Naruto walks around the seal, drinking it in fully. The look in his eyes is worrying to everybody else as the group sees the expression on his face change from a look of awe to shock and confusion, to worry, and finally to gratefulness. I never knew. Naruto says sadly. What is it? Ruby asks. It would only make sense that the theory was taught to Shizen. She just never saw the need to apply it to herself. She never did see herself as a fighter. Naruto says sadly. He holds up a hand to stop anybody from asking any more questions. Sorry, Jin. This may be seen as cheating, but I kind of need to do this for somebody, Naruto says. Jin appears beside him before waving him on with a smirk. Naruto nods before creating at least 50 clones. They all form a circle around the seal as the original Naruto walks around them, giving them all instructions. The clones all focus on the outer part of the seal closest to them before slowly stepping inward, their attention focused solely on the seal below them. The original Naruto walks back to the group, Okay, you can ask questions now. First of all, Weiss says haughtily. You made no sense earlier. What is going on here? Second of all, what are they doing? Naruto chuckles slightly, before quickly starting to explain when glares are leveled at him. Shizen is Sonade's student. You all saw what Sonade Sozo says A can do. I never thought about it, but Shizen had to have been taught the theory of it. Sonade cares about the people close to her too much to not try and teach it to Shizen. Shizen never really saw herself as a fighter though. She was Jonin level, but that was more because of her medical skills than fighting skills. She knew how to fight people as well as she did because of how good of a medical mean she was. What I'm trying to say is that she didn't apply the seal to herself. She must have found a way to apply it to others. 
I think that's what this is. This seal has a lot of healing and human anatomy components, specifically regeneration. She is using the hair to lower the stress on Niji's body. It might still shorten his life, but not enough to really be able to tell the difference. That's something you can't do on the battlefield. But here, what she is doing right here is absolutely genius. That's, that's incredible. Weiss says. Why did you look worried though? Naruto frowns at this, because there is a reason that this seal isn't very practical. Healing this way takes an enormous amount of chakra. Even with four people channeling their chakra to Niji, it's not enough to heal him as fast as he needs it. It would have taken more than just three hours. Shizen made the seal in a way that the other four's chakra is transferred to her, and she used their chakra to transfer directly to Niji. Why is that a bad thing? Blake asks in confusion. Ashpin's eyes widen in realization. The reason she is doing it that way is because she's doing something that she can't ask the other doctors to do. Naruto nods solemnly. It looks like Shizen is sacrificing some of her own life force to speed up the process. She can't ask the other doctors to do that, so she is using herself as the medium. She didn't even know Niji. She did it for me. Silence reigns through the group. They don't know how to use that information. Looking at the frozen look on Shizen's face, Ruby gets an idea. But look at her, Ruby says, breaking Naruto's attention away from his own musings. She wants to do this. She is completely determined to save him for you. She really, really cares about you. Naruto looks at Shizen's unwavering face. Her eyebrows were furrowed as wind whipped her hair around her face. Even the sheer amount of chakra flowing around her didn't distract her from the task at hand. Even though it was sad to think that Shizen sacrificed that for him, it was nice to know that he had somebody willing to do that for him so early on. Thanks, Ruby. Naruto says quietly, before looking at her and giving her a bright smile. Ruby responds with a smile of her own, her cheeks slightly more colored than they previously were. And what are your clones doing? Blake asks, interrupting the small moment the two had. Naruto nods, they are memorizing the seal. This is the first time that I've been shown the way that the Sozo Seze works. If any of you are able to learn it, I want to be able to teach it. Your clones. Blake blinks a couple of times. Your clones are memorizing it? How does that help you? I learn what they do, Naruto says simply, momentarily forgetting about Blake's previous interest in the technique. Oh no, Ruby says with a wince as she sees Blake's jaw drop. As Blake starts to harass Naruto about other uses of shadow clones, the clones focusing on the seal finish what they were doing and disperse. Without another word, time resumes, cutting Blake's interrogation short. With a pout, Blake joins everybody else in watching as Niji is healed. Finally, it's Shikamaru, who is standing outside of Choji's room with Tamari and his father, Shikaku. Sanade had just come out and informed them that Choji was going to be alright. Shizen came out, looking entirely exhausted but confirming that he too was alright. She then informed them that Naruto and Kakashi had returned. As Sanade informed Shikamaru that the mission was a failure, Everybody watching noticed that tears were falling onto the ground in front of the new Chunin. Naruto looks at Shikamura sadly as his shoulders shake, struggling to hold in the tears. His first mission after promotion, Crow says with a frown. Two of his friends almost die, and they failed in the end. Rough. Next time. Shikamura starts, tears streaming down his face. I'll carry out the mission perfectly. The downfall of intelligence and the pursuit of perfection is often hindsight and the lack of perfection, Ashpin says wisely. Maria nods beside him as the rest watch the emotional scene. The scene changes once again, to Naruto in his hospital bed, talking with Shikamaru. Your whole body is wrapped. Ruby says sadly. Naruto shrugs. Wasn't the worst I've had. Don't worry. He ends with a reassuring smile, though it does nothing to ease Ruby's worries. Not the worst he's had? She thinks sadly, her previously forgotten thoughts resurfacing. The scene changes, but rather than moving to another time, they see themselves out in the hallway outside of Naruto's room. Sakura was outside, preparing to enter the room just as Naruto told Shikamaru that Sasuke was gone. I didn't know she was right there. Naruto says with a frown. Sanade walks up to her, and together they enter the room. The group smiles slightly when Sakura, rather than showing how upset she was, tries her best to cheer Naruto up. Naruto's younger self reassures Sakura that he would bring Sasuke back like he promised. And that is the promise that killed me, Naruto says as the scene faded away. Team RWY looks into their black surroundings blankly. Would they be able to continue to bring somebody back to them if they had gone for the kill? If they had shoved a hand through their chest? For Ruby, absolutely, Young thinks to herself, meeting eyes with Ruby, and knowing that she was thinking the same. It was still difficult for them to understand. All of RWY loved each other, but how do you continue pursuing somebody that tried to kill you? Jin appears before them again. After this mission, Naruto goes on quite a few missions, but eventually agrees to go on a training trip with Jiraiya. They spend quite a bit of time training, and eventually return to the village. That is where things start to get interesting. How so? Ashman asks with a raised eyebrow. That's when the Akatsuki starts hunting us Jinchuriki, 
Naruto says, interrupting Jin. Jin nods in agreement. Now, before we start the next part. She trails off, before clapping twice. Naruto looks around, noticing that everybody was gone. Everybody except. That's right, Naruto says, looking at Ruby with his hands on his hips. It was probably a good thing that Jin either already knew or heard Naruto's thoughts. I think we need to have a talk. Ruby takes in a deep breath before nodding. All right, let's talk. Thank you so much for watching our video. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed creating it for you. If you liked what you saw, please smash the like button and don't forget to subscribe to stay updated with our latest content. All credit to the author for the incredible story we shared today. Their amazing work made this video possible and we can't thank them enough. The story information can be found in the description below. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. The info can be found in the description. Before you go, why not check out another one of our videos? We've got plenty more stories and adventures waiting for you. Just click on the video popping up on your screen right now. Thanks again for being part of our journey. See you in the next video.